Well, did it work? We blasted right off. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> what? Here's us. Time is now. Wow. <laughs> You're glistening from your scooter ride. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. you're not. I just no. thought it would be nice to talk about your scooter, and that seemed like a good way. Can you first, just in case people are like, whose voice is this? I've never heard it before. Maybe just introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Andy J. Pizza. I'm an illustrator and a podcaster and a public speaker, and I make picture books. And yeah, I have a podcast called Creative Pep Talk, so that's me. That's you. Great to meet you. Just kidding. We've Yay. met before. I have your book, your first, I think your first. Yeah. Right, right there. Creative pep talk. Right. There it is. That's right there. Uh, there yeah, it that's, is. I mean, it took me a long time to find my footing in the publishing. So that's my first kind of anthology book, but I had hmm. other kinds of of books before that <laughs> that were different yep. like coloring books and poster books and dream journal and then i did that book and then pretty much since then i've been making picture books so i have like a handful of picture books do you consider yourself an author i do now yeah i do yeah. i did it for a while like do like, you introduce yourself as author normally to people i forget to that's why i didn't mention it earlier yeah when i'm being official i usually yeah. do say i'm an author and illustrator even though technically, like I got an author credit on like the coloring books and the anthologies and stuff like that, I didn't start using it until last summer was my first picture book that I had a co-author credit. And then I have another picture book coming out in April that is a, a co-author credit. So, and I've wrote those. I feel like mm -hmm. ah, I wrote these and I'm really proud of the writing and the story. So yeah, I've just That's started amazing. to. So yeah. I I think a lot of artists struggle with this elevator pitch, especially because we're just yeah. called to do a lot of different things when we're creative. And even yeah. for me, my book is 90% written mm -hmm. and I still am like, well, I wrote a book, but it's not a book. It's a workbook. <laughs> and then I'm like justifying that I have a book yeah. that was on a bestseller list, like not the bestseller list, but on a bestseller list. Awesome. And it's hard to get that validation, I guess, from yourself when like someone else has already told me I'm an author, like it's already published, but I got to claim it. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> this is not as relevant. Is it on the office that like, who is it? Robert California introduces himself and he's like, he says what he doesn't like. Is that him? I, I know the office very well and I can't place that. Same. Because I was just listening to that Office Ladies episode, and I'm trying yeah. to remember who it was who introduced themselves by like things that they don't enjoy or like don't do, and then it set off Angela and Jenna on like what they would introduce themselves by. I don't like those. What's it called when you do like a workout that's like really intense? High and impact. It's, High, well, yeah. Yeah, I guess they were workout. they were like, "Hi, it's me, Angela, and I don't like doing." Hit workouts. <laughs> okay, wait. So what, let's, let's what would yours be, Andy? Restart. Yeah, restart. Introduce Ooh, yourself with great, things you don't like. Great icebreaker yeah. question. I really like it. What I don't like, I mean, my number one thing I don't like is being bored. I don't like being mm. I don't like being trapped. That's a particular I Like physically that, or emotionally yeah. or both. All yes. <laughs> yes. I don't I think my ADHD manifests in a sort of Peter Pan syndrome of like wanting to fly and get out of there and move. And actually, it's why I don't like flying in an airplane is it's very mm, trapped. Yeah. I mean, I do it all yep. the time, but I don't like it. Same. Yeah, I don't like yeah. being bored. Uh, that's probably the number one thing. That's really interesting because I also, I was diagnosed with ADD back when it was called ADD back so long ADD. ago. <laughs> the I think I was probably middle school and I also don't like airplanes. I'm not like, oh, this is scary. I'm like, I don't like it. Same. I just don't like it. But I also, I really love routine and structure and knowing what's coming and planning. But I also love trying new things, not necessarily like, I'm going to go skydiving. That yeah, sounds yeah. fun. That doesn't sound that fun to me. <laughs> but like new things, like little tiny things like, oh, this is a new pen. I have to try every new pen that ever existed or silly things like that. But Same. I also crave, it's like that balancing act of those two things of wanting to try something new and also wanting to say exactly the same. I, what would your not like thing be, Alana? The first thing that came to mind was okra. That's funny because mine was water <laughs> chestnuts. We both went with uh, food. I have a yeah. real thing against water chestnuts. It's useless. It tastes like nothing. <laughs> it's 
just getting in my way. I just get really mad when anybody puts water chestnuts in my food. <laughs> Weirdly, you both went for very textury things. Yeah. And okra is a, I feel like it's hard to cook. You cook it wrong. I've never. Yeah, it gets, it. it can get slimy. That's for yeah. sure. But have you had a fried okra, Alana? No, but that, I would be, mm. I would probably be sick to my stomach. I have pickled okra in my fridge right now. I go literally. Pickled, pickled seems. Yeah, go get it. <laughs> Toss it to me. <laughs> Just, <laughs> she'll be no? disgusted. I don't know why we both went to food, but I am a little bit sensory sensitive and I get overstimulated, but okra just tastes disgusting to me. And that's because I had it once as a kid and decided it was gross. And now oh. I forever think it's gross. It's not even like I haven't even tried it as an adult. I don't know, but you and your We'll have to cheese. try it again <laughs> together and see if we can get over that hump. Okay. It's maybe. It's really or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that we know the stuff you don't like, and also that would be kind of intimidating though, if you did introduce yourself with that, like at a meeting or something, hi, I'm Andy and I don't like to be bored. It feels <laughs> yeah, kind of like a, a threat. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, I, it's complicated. I've thought that before. I've thought even just admitting that I'm very allergic to boredom is yeah. kind of... I mean, part of the reason I do it actually. So make it worth my while, okay? I know. It, that, that's, I've, <laughs> I've thought that many times. But part of the reason I do it is because I think there are so many things associated with ADHD that are kind yeah. of confused as being like, oh, you're just a bad person. Mm. Oh, you're just a bad adult. No, no, no. You can't be bored. And like, I get that. But I also think, I think that's part of me just trying to do my tiny little part to normalize stuff like that. For like, sure. Hey, I'm understimulated. Okay. Right. So, and I can take care of it though. That's the thing. I can entertain myself in almost any scenario, but- if I warn you, you might be aware of like, oh, he's being a complete weirdo. It's probably because he's bored. It's probably because he's like, he's jazzing it up. Like that, so <laughs> right. but It's not even it. like you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs. Like, I'm so bored. I'm in a bad mood. It's like your brain, like literally is like, help me. I'm bored. I'm going to run in a million miles <laughs> in different screaming. directions and be confused. And then yeah. your face is going to glass over and everyone's gonna be like, what's happening? That's at least that's how mine that's manifests. It. But we both have kids. So I feel like it's either really easy to be bored or really hard to be bored. Yeah, that's because you're I just mean, tired. Yeah. yeah, you're tired. And, and there are definitely <laughs> elements of child rearing that I think are difficult for people with ADHD because of the monotony. Yeah, just the sacrifice and things like of that nature. So you have to get very creative, I think, if you're Absolutely. an ADHD parent. Good thing you're um, creative for a living. Yeah. Exactly. Well, hey, that I'm glad we out. got, yeah, I'm glad we started this with all the relevant information. But listen, when I interview someone who also interviews people, so people probably have heard of you before and listened to your podcast and learned things about yeah, you. Yeah, because you're like, what, 400 something episodes deep? Yeah, 445 today. That's yeah. a whole lot. You got a lot of them podcasts under your belt. I really do. And they're <laughs> huge. These podcasts, they don't fit under belts that well. <laughs> but we like to ask I don't know questions. What that means. <laughs> Sorry. We, we like to ask questions that other people maybe haven't heard or yeah. so it's great that we started by talking about whatever it is that we were just talking about okra Water <laughs> chestnuts. i want to take yeah. things in a bit of a different direction though sure, if you don't sure. mind that, yeah i think that's okay <laughs> I mean, that was a great start, but I was kind of wondering if I could read you something that almost like a Dear Abby letter, except for it's Dear Andy. Love it. <laughs> this wasn't like submitted or anything. I just saw this post on Instagram maybe yesterday or two days ago, and it really resonated with me. And there were a lot of artists in the comments being like, oh my gosh, this resonates. So I thought I'd read it to you and kind of get your take on it. Do you know Real Fun Wow? Sounds Darren familiar. Thomas McGee. Okay, so he posted this post and it says, I used to be an artist. I would make whatever I wanted without an audience in mind. I felt free to create without boundaries or external considerations, pure expression. But then I started sharing my work and it was received well. Then I began to get hooked on the feeling of validation and I was no longer creating for the pure joy of expression. And then I started making money from my work and now my expression was suddenly tied to my ability to support myself. I no longer felt like an artist, free to express myself however I felt called to, but instead a brand that was creating work that was merely sellable. My voice no longer felt authentic, no longer my own. It began to feel like I was trying to figure out what the audience wanted me to say, and in that I've become somewhat delusioned, unsure of where I am in all of this, stuck in the middle of that unfortunate place of where art and commerce meet. I've been very fortunate to have been able to turn 
what I've created into a viable source of income, but I have drifted so far from where I started. I used to be an artist. And the comments are just popping off with people being like, oh my gosh. And I just felt like that so succinctly addressed so much of what we've been hearing lately. And I would love to hear kind of your take on that, if you have been able to relate to that at any point and what you might say to people who are kind of in that place. Okay. I think that, that yeah, that's is, a lot. We went, we went intense yeah, I after. Love, hey, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of my favorite. Th- that's the least boring yeah. thing to me. So you know your audience. You're really playing to the audience. Okay. So my brain had 800 thoughts around mm-hmm. that, and there were a lot on kind of both sides of how you could think about this. And so I think my first response is. I feel like the most obvious answer to that is maybe too simple. So I think the most obvious answer that you're going to hear a lot of people reply to that with is just go back to making what you want and who cares about anybody else, man? That's the secret sauce. And I think that I'll tell you the most simple amendment to that that I would make is that that is maybe step one. But I think most advice or most kind of, I don't know, axioms of creativity that people live by and create by are often like too binary. It's either like do this or don't do that or like whatever. It's never like as nuanced as a process because a process requires different energy at different stages. For me, I'm not like a huge Rick Rubin guy, not because I'm anti Rick Rubin or anything. I just don't subscribe to a bunch of his stuff. I haven't read his book, whatever, but you know, he's been all over the place lately. And I heard him say something that I thought, this is really brilliant because it has so much nuance within what he's saying. And he says that he'll always tell musicians that the audience comes last. And what I love about that is that doesn't mean do not consider the audience. It doesn't mean that's not part of the equation. It doesn't mean just do whatever makes you feel good and creatively excited. It means that it's a process. And in that process, the consideration for the audience and the marketing and how you're going to package it or how you're going to edit what you did, that comes last. And before that comes your taste, which is another thing that I do agree. You know, that's been a huge through line in my creative thinking for the longest time that the starting block for creativity is really your taste, your personal taste, which starts with what you love and consume that turns into what you want to participate in and then turns into how you want to critique what's already out there and let that determine what you make next because it's more your taste. I don't feel like I'm above any of the stuff that's been said in that comment. I have all those feelings often, but yeah, I think the first piece of it for me is remembering that it's not binary. It's not either make stuff for your audience or make stuff for yourself, but that there can be like a process that you work through where you're doing Mm -hmm. both kind of well. I really like the audience comes last thought because I've really struggled in my attempts to merge the business and the commoditizing and the art with trying to follow different traditional business ideas and then seeing them not meld with the way that I want to be as a creative and trying to adjust and try different things from there. But yeah, definitely one of the things that I learned in my rudimentary marketing class that I took, my single business class that I took in college was to start with your audience and really get to know the audience and then create something for that audience. Mm -hmm. And I've created things in that way, but I've also created things with the audience last where I start with something that really excites me and then find the people who also find excitement in that thing. And that's just been so much more fulfilling. I think when it's just such a different area to come from as an artist than like other industries where you're just looking at money because there's so much more to this career as an artist. If it was just about money, we would approach it in a different way entirely. But I don't think yeah. anybody gets into art just for the money. No. That's kind of a <laughs> a weird choice if you're looking <laughs> to just make a bunch of money. It's not the right choice. If that's right. right. If you're trying to make a bunch of money, that's not really probably the best way to do it. But I also think that 
one thing that maybe has helped me with this is that I don't think it was my ultimate dream to be an illustrator. So I think that being an illustrator for me was an interpretation of a dream. So for me, there's a way where I hear a lot of people talk about, oh, now that this creativity has become a job, I've lost my passion for it and it's no longer my dream or it's no longer my passion. And I think for me, I was lucky that the thing that I chose had in mind, this is how I want to make a living. So it was a Venn diagram of this is the kind of creativity that I love and the kind of creativity that I think I could do over and over again and be paid to do it and not be miserable about it. And so, you know, that hasn't always worked out. Sometimes I am miserable about it, but I think that I'm kind of a big believer in just like your nighttime dreams don't make any sense without some kind of interpretation. I think our daydreams are pretty similar. I think that this idea, this notion that you just follow your heart and follow your dreams and it all work out and you'll never work a day in your life. We don't really have great examples of that for the most part. And if we do, they're mostly like, from what I can tell, the exception to the rule. And I can only tell from the outside because I don't know. I haven't lived that. But for me, those definitely seem like the exception to the rule. Yeah, I feel like especially now, there's so many options for people in terms of a career that don't seem like they have as much longevity. And I don't know if it's that we get bored faster or if we just dive so deep into something and we have these crazy expectations of it being everything we could ever dream of. And I think something that we've done, and I know you've done this too, and we can talk about that as well, is just pivoted when we've seen the through lines and the things that you've talked about in your work are going to stay the same. But whether it's in the form of publishing a book or doing your podcast, there's got to be more than one way to like output those, I think. And I wanted to use something about Katie as an example. I hope you don't mind me putting you in the hot seat. But I don't know yet. We'll see. Yeah. (laughs) Too late. Katie has a band with her husband and they're amazing. Like it brings tears to my eyes just thinking about the like sheer joy that they have just making things together like in there for themselves. And they came out with their what second single? I don't know. Yeah. Like I don't mm-hmm. know terminology. And she asked me like how do I put this out there? Like she has no desire to be like an influencer or talk to the camera and that's something she doesn't have to do in our job. And right now, this is as pretty much as far as it goes. And we were brainstorming all these other ways, but there's also this acceptance of social media is now ingrained in our culture. And so if you're not going to utilize it in some way, you have to do something else. You have to do something, whether that's playing live or whether that's using a different form of spreading the word or whatever. There's this added layer, I think, especially for young designers of social media and the pressure of like putting their work out there and then growing and then building this one thing that then they want to change completely. And I don't want anyone to box themselves in. I don't know. Those are just rambling thoughts that came up while you were speaking. But and I don't know if it's a pain point because it's really just you're just passionate well, about it. You just do it. Yeah, for I I think with art, I feel more established and like I've got more of a career going to where I don't have to put as much juice on the social media stuff. But I felt it so intensely when I started something new, like this band. And I was like, gosh, I'm putting so much of myself into this. I want people to hear it and interact with it because I have made it and I think it's cool. I just want to share it, but I don't want to do the dancing and the TikToking and the <laughs> like that just doesn't <laughs> that doesn't feel like me and i feel like you really have to play the algorithm game these days and it just doesn't feel authentic and andy you talk so much about authenticity and like really leaning into who you are in all the facets of what that means so i guess maybe the question that comes out of this is like how do we keep that authenticity when we're also up against not just the commoditization of it, but up against the algorithms and the trends that it's asking us to take on when they just feel like, ugh, that's not right for me. 
Okay. I think those are- That was a lot. (laughs) I love it. I mean, these are the things I think about all the time as a creator myself, as well as just as someone who makes a podcast for creative people and knows, like I said, from personal experience, the kind of pain points that people experience in trying to make creative stuff for a living, especially just right now, just everything just seems so in flux and whatever. Yeah. This is a great case study for the problem that most creators find themselves in. They want to do this thing, like you said, but in order to do this thing, they have to do all these other things that they maybe don't want to do. I think there's two parts to this for me. The first one is more abstract. The second one is much more strategic, practical. This is maybe a way to approach it. The abstract part of it is, I think, gets back to that idea of interpreting a daydream. I think interpreting a daydream, what I think the essence of that idea is, is that There's a way where everything about being on earth as a being that is a psyche or experiences life as consciousness floating in a sack of meat, right? Like there's a way where being on earth and being in reality feels wrong. It feels like, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to make my bed and get out of bed and make breakfast? Like there's something about, or like exercise and move this thing that I'm in. Why do I have to do that? So annoying. Like, I think a lot of people feel that way. And actually, you know, there's a lot of like spirituality and religion and philosophy that, you know, the Gnostics hated the body. They were like, the body's evil. The spirit's good. Throughout time, that's a conversation because I think it's a part of what it feels like to experience being a human. And so I think anything that you try to do is an interpretation of that like psyche, spirit, dreamy, conscious part of you that feels like this is the authentic, true self. And so every time you try to like manifest that into the world, there's a way in which you're losing something. You're not being authentic. You know, it reminds me of like Jim Carrey talking about how as he plays all these characters and movies, he realized Jim Carrey was a character and then had this existential crisis of like, I am not this. I'm not this thing, this body, this expression of, you know, whatever. So I almost feel like being on this earth is kind of like making peace with an inauthentic expression of your being. I'm very for authenticity. I'm very for like, trying to connect it to that deeper part of yourself. But I also think, I like what Seth Godin talks about where he's like, you don't want your surgeon to not do the surgery because he's just not into it today. It's just not authentic. (laughs) Like like that's, you know what I mean? Like, no, just you're doing to do the job. And so I think that there's a way where that line of logic can maybe get you in trouble and also keep you from trying things because the first time you try something, You're not going to feel authentic. You're going to feel clumsy. You're going to feel like, this isn't me. I don't know how to play a guitar. This isn't authentic. Now, Mm. I I think authenticity, like I said, trying to connect to the core as much as you can and that being like a true north that you're aiming for but will never maybe achieve is a good thing. It's one of the reasons I talk about it a lot or think about it a lot. But that's the abstract side. And then we can maybe get into One second. I just love that you said, yeah, I love that you said clumsy because it made me think that we often confuse uncomfortable and inauthentic. Yeah. And I just wanted to put a circle and a exclamation point and a highlight around that because that just struck something for me. I mean, I feel, yeah, that's something I think about all the time. Like I just emceed an event for the first time. I don't have any intention of ever being an MC. I don't want to do that. It's not something I've ever aspired to do. I did it because it was a place I wanted to go be and hang out and connect with people. It was a podcast festival. And I just did it because I thought, I've never done it. I don't want to do it, but I also don't know that I won't want to do it once I've done it. And so I halfway through, I can feel like this is awkward. This is weird. This feels inauthentic because I've never done this before. Whenever I feel those things, I try to remember like, yeah, that's what it feels like to do something for the first time for most of us. So yeah, I'm glad you- And that's where the underline. growth happens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I yeah. think okay. I used to be an adjunct professor. I don't know if I've ever shared much mm. about that here, but I taught graphic design to students in the school where I went to school and what an experience. Mm. But I also was an art director at that university in the marketing department. And I was able to hire students at like a really good paying job. They could just like come in between classes. It was amazing. And they were so hungry. And I don't know what happens when we leave 
the education space or like the beginner space where we're not as hungry to like show up and be bad at something. Like they would just try any idea and they would be like, I'd be like, do you know how to do this with like this? Or maybe like that? They'd be like, sure, let me take a go, go at it and see what happens. And they just weren't as scared. Yeah. I don't know if it's the setting or what it is, but I want that. I want to well, be they're, able they're to- They're like allowed to be a beginner. They've got right. like flashing lights around that are like, this is the place where you right. are starting. And like right. later on, where we have different expectations of ourselves. Right. And I want to let go of those and let myself yeah. be bad again. But also I want to be so excited that I'm willing to try 20 different times and not be so attached to the outcome, but just be like, I did it. Not this isn't as good or this isn't perfect or this didn't go viral or anything like that, but I freaking did the thing. And I think yeah. detaching ourselves from that, like, I don't know if it's like ego or whatever it is, that I feel like is one of the biggest barriers of working for yourself is like, not only do we have to monetize, which like that's to live, but now we have to like take our creativity and put expectations on it and boundaries. And it just makes it a lot more challenging to tap into those things that light you up even more. And I love the idea of going and doing something new and recognizing, is this not feel authentic or does this just feel new and different? Yeah. What does it really feel like? Because if you ask me to design your website, I am it's not going to feel authentic to me and I'm also going to hate it. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> but if, but if I'm going to sit down and like try and figure draw with my son, I'm going to feel really bad at it because it's been a while, mm -hmm. but is it going to feel good? I don't know. Like you have to keep trying to get past that really uncomfortable space. And I really envy the people yeah. who are willing to show up and like be bad at something. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of uncomfortable anytime we sit down in front of a blank piece of paper. <laughs> Because suddenly we just forget how to draw or like we lose all confidence in ourselves that we've ever done anything good before. <laughs> At least a lot of people I know feel that way. So, I mean, that's a good point, Andy. It's just a part of being freaking alive, being a human on this spinning rock. <laughs> it's awkward, man. It's weird. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's true. And I love what you said about just wishing that you could get into that beginner space, this idea that students by the nature of being a student like the idea of that is this isn't real like you're in this safe zone where it doesn't count i'm actually working on a bigger episode about this idea that there's a phrase that i hear a lot of when you know someone like taylor swift or beyonce or back in the day a kanye west or whatever they'll say oh they don't miss like oh man they don't miss and I think that's become sort of, especially with like the internet highlight culture thing, that that has become the name of the game of creativity is like never missing. And I think that's really bad. And the way I thought about it was like, it's almost like bullying a kid who's never heard of soccer. And you're like, hey, go play this sport. It's called handball. Okay. He's going to go in there and he's going to be instantly playing so poorly doing the opposite of what the point of this sport is, which is to kick it, that it's going to go so bad that kid's never going to want to play again. Right. Because that's the opposite of it. And the truth is based on what the studies and the research says about creativity, never missing is the opposite of a thriving creative practice because the whole idea of there's really interesting studies around this, like one of them gets told in two different ways. I can't remember which one's true. It's in the book Atomic Habits, but it's appeared in different places. And it's this idea that it was either photography or ceramics. And they had two different groups that were going to take this class in a completely different way. And one group was like, hey, let's just say it's photography. They're like, well, you only have to take one photo. The whole I'm pretty semester. sure it was photography. I think it was ceramic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to well, say no, I thought it was ceramics. Because <laughs> it's been told both ways. <laughs> I one mean, it's probably way, the same story. It's the same story. I just can't remember which one was the real one. When they told it in the story, they wanted to obscure details to like, gotcha. uh, I don't know. Okay, so whatever. I, can't, I just can't remember which one. Okay. But they're like, either this group only has to take one photo, but their whole grade is on that photo. And then this group gets graded by how many photos they take. And the best photos were obviously in the group that took the most photos. There's also studies about how publishing 
scientific papers is a very creative thing. It requires tons of innovation and creativity and creative thinking. And they've studied that and they found that the people that are like these scientific geniuses that have the most hit papers also have the most duds. They correlate. And so really, that's why thinking of creativity as the never missing is like calling soccer handball, because really it's miss most, hit most. That's what it should be called. I think it also goes hand in hand with this idea of like not being cringe, mm -hmm. not being cringe because you're missing publicly when you put out creative work that doesn't hit. And I actually think that's just the name of the game like that. You have to yeah. be comfortable with that. It's so interesting too, because it's making me think about how I approach my creating art versus creating music very differently. And mm. I honestly think I'm in a much healthier place with creating music mm. because I iterate way more and I'm like not afraid to spend an hour or two hours trying something. And then I like am excited to move on to the next thing. And then I like let it be what it is. And if I want to come back to it and develop it, I can. But I don't do that with art. With art, I'm like, every time I sit down, I have to make this into a final piece that I can use and I yeah. can make money from. And I put so much more pressure on it. It's very interesting. I think part of that is because it is our job. So yep. we have right. a deadline. And so we're in the process of writing a book together right now. It'll come out in fall of 2025. Congrats. And we are, thanks. And cool. we are spending a lot of time sitting, just like sitting and thinking about it. Yeah. And I think we're giving it kind of the attention it deserves. Whereas we get a deadline from a client, we're like, okay, here's what we've got. Like, it's something that we have to accept about when we do have to monetize. When we make a choice to monetize is that some of the stuff is going to be for the job and we have to make room. And that's what I was actually curious about. You do a lot of things. And part of that is like your ADHD superpower. And part of it is just, you've been doing this a long time. You have systems in place. You have a network. You have the co-loop team. How do you make time personally? And you're a parent. How do you make time personally for some of these things? Like you're reading, you're just creating for fun. You're traveling to events. How are you not pushing yourself towards burnout and I mean, making, yeah. <laughs> what helps me avoid more burnout? I haven't cracked it. I get burnout as frequent as probably anybody, but I do think over time I've learned things that have helped. There was a quote that his name's Josh Linkner, and he's really kind of famous in the public speaking circuit, but he's a jazz musician and he's bought a bunch of companies. He's very much in like the business world. He talks about, he has a book about reinvention and it's all about how every business is going to have a business that puts them out of business. But if you are a master of reinvention, you can be that business that puts you out of business. You can just continually reinvent to the point where every 10 years or so you have a different business that takes over. And I think for me, that's just the way that my career has gone is that every five to 10 years, my personal work becomes my professional work. But then I have to have more personal work that then will become the professional work. And I love that. that. And that, I think recognizing those seasons is the most difficult part to it. Recognizing like, oh, that part's over or this part that I want to be everything. It's not its time yet. It's my time to pour into it. And then usually by the time it becomes the professional thing, that's usually where the flow being this balance of challenge and mastery, by the time you're getting paid, you're probably so good at it that you're not as in flow because flow is 20% challenge. You're more like fully mastered it. So it's not where your joy is. It's not where you're most losing yourself. And that's good because people are paying you to do it. You're also like keeping the thing alive by having a disciplined relationship to your personal practice. And so mm -hmm. even though that makes it hard not to burn out, that is a thing that is a very difficult thing because you end up doing a lot of stuff and spending a lot of time making, and then that becomes a whole other challenge to figure out. I haven't found a way around having both those pieces. And the other piece to that is, like you were saying about a client project, once a client project lands, if it's really client work, which I... I would say is distinctly different than like when I do a book, books and client work, I treat really differently. With a client project, most of the time, I'm not 
being super creative, I'm stealing from my personal practice. When I did make a bunch of stuff, when I did make a hundred pieces that sucked and I'm pulling from the five that were good, then that's the stuff that's going to make it into the paid stuff. Because you're doing that, because you have a personal practice, like as a human, when are you scheduling that in? Genuinely, like routine wise, when are you scheduling that in? Because I think Katie and I are doing that kind of same thing where we're doing something on the side that we're not getting paid for fun that we're hoping, like with our book, we started working on it, we're pitching it, we're coming up with the concept, you know, writing an outline and then a year or so later. But I think we're doing it on like a micro scale because I think part of it is that we're newer to at least the good type being our world. And you've been doing books and your podcasts and things quite a bit longer. And so part of it is like, we're doing it on this micro level. Every three months, we're like, what worked, what didn't? What are we doing for fun that we want more of? But the time, and not to sound like, I know we all work really hard. I know how many hours there are in a day, but I feel like we are often pulled in the direction of like putting out little fires or doing these little things that inch us forward. Whereas we have struggled to make the time for the fun things that still relate to our work in some capacity. Yeah, I think, so for me, what has been super essential is that the personal work is a practice, meaning it is a discipline. And it being a practice and being a discipline means that it has very literal constraints. So for me, the way that manifests is always project-based. So since 2011, at least, I've had a personal practice of some kind that comes in the form of a personal project that's either ongoing or semi long term. And the way I schedule it is I'm making that personal practice something that I know I could commit to on a weekly basis. So back when that was a daily drawing project where I was drawing a new character every weekday for a year, I was all the parameters of that were such that I knew I could do that in one hour. I could design, scan, color, and post that character every day within one hour. And that's what I knew I could commit to based on my schedule. I knew I could do that. Then when I started the podcast, I knew I wanted to do 100 episodes before I gave up. That was quite a big commitment. That was the biggest project that I committed to, but it was based on my experience of I knew this was in the vein of where I wanted to take my career next, which was public speaking was really my aim at that point. And I had had such a intense experience, positive experiences with public speaking up into that point. I just knew I was in a place where I knew I could commit on a longer term thing. When I first started that, you know, for the first year, I wasn't making episode art. I couldn't commit to that. What I could commit to was... 20 minutes to an hour of stream of consciousness, essentially, you know, I had a plan or had an idea. I'm like, oh, this is an episode. And I might've done a really loose outline, but all I was committing to was once a week, I'm going to record myself talking about this thing and post it to the internet. And I know that's going to take me about two hours a week. And so I could commit to that. And then as it became something I got paid for, then I could start to turn that into my day job and at least part of my day job and just kind of allocate. Now I'm probably spending anywhere from seven to 10 hours a week on an episode. And I'm doing that every single week, you know, but I also don't consider it my personal practice anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my professional practice. And now my personal practice is something else. So yeah, does that make sense? So that's kind of how I think about it is that you create that discipline because through the lens of a project, That is something you can commit to. And it's not unlike like exercise or something where you're like, okay, if running is going to be a thing that is a serious part of my life, it's not going to be, I'll just run when I fit it in or I'll run. For me, it had to be, I'm going to run three miles every other day. Like that's it. Because I think I can fit that in. I think I have the stamina to do that or, you know, whatever. And it gives you room. commitment. Right. And it gives you the room to say, well, if I miss this day, I have this day. Like you said, with the weekdays only, I think something shifted for me for sure when I started treating my business like it was a client instead of Mm. like it was my baby or something. I think that's sort of the same thing you're saying. It's like, take it as seriously as you would take any other project you were getting paid for. And I really appreciate that. Katie, did you remember what you were going to? I did. Finally. 
you were talking about moving towards like the next iteration of you and your style and your business always and you being the one to replace you. And I thought just having that mindset is really important because on the flip side, if you don't have that, I think that's where you foster fear and protectiveness around your niche. And we've seen a lot of issues with this in the industry that we're in with like literal cease and desist letters for like using the same medium as somebody else or, you know, (laughs) like people bullying other people for saying, you know, they're copying them when it's not that at all. Or, you know, stuff of that nature. Yeah, Right. And I just thought it was really important to talk about that, that mindset shift, because I think that fear mindset is really toxic. And just the fact that I've seen it around so much, I just wanted to kind of bring that up. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's a great thing to bring up because I do think it's based in fear, not based in creativity. Because one of the things that I feel like I had to and have to continue to learn the hard way is that when you find something that look like finding something that works creatively in terms, especially in the degree in which you can make it a business is a difficult thing. It doesn't happen often. It does require hundreds of episodes of a podcast or all kinds of investment and exploration. And it's hard. I get it. I get the scarcity within your own life that leads to that kind of fear. I understand that. And so I too can fall into that pattern of being like, this thing works. I need to hold on to it. It's mine. I got, you know, that kind of vibe. I get that, but I have to remember that I got into this because I wanted to be creative for a living. And once I'm clinging on to doing the same thing over and over again, I'm no longer being creative for a living. Because guess what? That's not creative. Being creative is doing different things. And I actually, when I first got into this, and a lot of people I think can relate to growing up and you're a creative person and you're doing music and you're doing art and you're doing all these things and someone's like, hey, you got to pick one, okay? You got to just focus on one and do that thing. And you're like, okay, I'll do it. And then you finally do it. And you're, oh, I'm an illustrator. I'm a designer. I'm whatever. For a living, this is awesome. And then all of a sudden, TikTok and Instagram Reels and all and podcasts and all this stuff show up. And they're like, actually, you're going to have to do more than illustration. And all of a sudden, you're like, no, I don't want to. And you're like, hello, you loved making fake radio shows when you were a kid. You love doing mm-hmm. videos. You love making stupid songs. You lo- That's being creative. You didn't want to do one thing. You didn't want to right. do the same thing. The creative spirit is embracing the new things. That's it. Oh, that's given me chills. And I, I feel like conversations like these remind me that sometimes I accidentally suck the fun out of things because I get too serious about the strategy behind it. And then, for example, the theme song for this podcast, I did it and I just had a lot of fun with it. And it just like flew out of me and it's like silly and stupid. And I I had fun. Yeah. (laughs) No, I sent it to Alana and we both had a good laugh. And like, that's a good shining reminder. Like, Hey, that's how you infuse yourself into this stuff. And that's how you have fun and remember the things that you loved as a kid and bring that into your current work life. You know, what else is really nice about the digital space that's always changing is that the lifespan of if you put something on youtube let's say it's there and people can reference it for years to come there's a really a pretty long lifespan on there things can be relevant for a while whereas when you're posting on social media the lifespan is like a couple days and nobody's really going back six months a year to see other information and so it's not really that deep you know it's okay Yeah. It's not that big a deal. Just put it out there. And yeah. yeah, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And you know, I really appreciate that you've pivoted to focus on your Substack and your Patreon because those feel more fulfilling to you right now than posting on Instagram. And I've been on a personal Instagram hiatus for several months. And man, it's like I can see clearly again. Like I can actually yeah. look at something and be like, I like that. Nobody's telling me to like it. Nobody's sending me an affiliate link. I'm just deciding I like it. I think I was getting a little muddled for a second there on figuring out what I like. Yeah. When you have billionaire tech backed companies, scientists working against you, literally, I think we always get like bummed out. Like, man, I can't believe I got sucked into this. Like, 
Do you have any idea how many thousands of people are dedicated to sucking you into this for their benefit so that you make content for their TV channel that they don't pay for? Right. Hello. Of course you do. It's very, I'm not that smart. Like I can't outwit all these people, man. But I'm glad you brought that up because I think it goes back to the practical section that I was going to mention in terms of yes. music or whatever. <laughs> we um, came back to it. Yeah, because when it comes to Substack or Patreon or whatever, it kind of gets to this, how I think about being on the internet as a creator, as a creative person, which may or may not have anything to do with social media. And so when you were talking about music... We talked about how the inauthentic, being in a body, all that abstract stuff. But the practical stuff is, I think that the feeling that you need to be on social media, I think is a manufactured thing by culture. I think it's a manufactured thing by tech. I really do. Because if you were making this music, and I'm assuming that it's not like car jingle commercials that you're making. I'm assuming that's not what you're doing. I think we can safely assume that. (laughs) Right? I'm guessing, right? Okay, okay. I got lucky there. But (laughs) but it's not the kind of stuff that needs to be on public access or cable TV next to televangelists and C-SPAN and infomercials. And guess what? That's TikTok. That's Instagram Reels. Instagram Reels is America's Funniest Home Videos. Like it's the most base level entertainment that used to be on free TV when you turned on your TV and you just had an antenna. Like that's the kind of stuff that's on there now because that's where most people are consuming stuff. And so you wouldn't buy a commercial for your band and put it and run it in an infomercial television channel because guess what? People aren't going there to find music. So I think for me, whenever I think about my creative business, I'm thinking it really needs to have three layers. And the last layer that I'm going to think about is how people discover it. Because I need to start with what's the value that doesn't change, which is like a creative thing that's at the core, because there's probably part of you that's the same when you're doing design work or illustration work or whatever that's doing the music. There's some Mm -hmm. kind of through line creatively. A lot of creativity has some kind of core pieces that kind of go throughout no matter what you're doing, whether you're publishing science papers or making songs or whatever. And especially the way that you do it, there's probably even a more niche specific thing about how you approach that. That value is like the most important thing. Then if it's going to be a business, you have to have a product. You have to have a way that people support it. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people in music have a hard time with justifiably so because again they have huge industries that have created this problem where the product for a musician is not obvious so we all like the idea of a thousand true fans where just get a thousand people to spend a hundred bucks on you a year and you got a hundred thousand dollars you got a basic salary but what is the product when you're a musician when people don't buy music now it doesn't mean that it there isn't a product it just means that extra work has to be taken to get that. And I think you can even see this all the way through the top. Like a lot of musicians are bankrupt until they start a merch line because that's stuff that people buy. That's a product. And then they make sure that the value that they have lead to the product. Then start thinking about how are people actually going to discover this thing and putting effort into how people actually discover that thing. So I see very, very few musicians do this. And if I was a musician, what I would do is I would quit thinking about social media completely and I would use Spotify as social media only. I don't think Spotify is your back catalog. You know, having an amazing Spotify presence in terms of like perfectly crafted, like these are my albums, like everything's like perfect, like it's your discography, feels akin to spending too much time on your Instagram grid and not Mm -hmm. enough on the posts. The people I think that are the most successful on Spotify, their Spotify page is a nightmare in terms of trying to like wrap your head around like their discography. Um, Because it's, I think it's honestly, the primary use of it is that's how people discover music on Spotify. And so if I was doing it, I'd be like, my Spotify would just be 99% collabs and singles. 
Mm. And I put my albums on there, but that's not what I would use it for. And that all goes down back to like having a product, having a way to discover that product in a way that actually makes sense. And so people accidentally discover music on TikTok and Instagram, but I don't know hardly anybody that opens those apps to find new music. It's like mm -hmm. swimming upstream, right? Yeah. And there's some kind of streaming joke. Yeah. There. I don't know, but that that's the thing I think about a lot. Like, okay, if you're worried about social media because you're worried about being discovered because you want to make money, but do you even have a product that is viable? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's a rant. Sorry. That's a good one. Yeah. It's a good one. I think the same goes for artists on Pinterest too. Like if you don't want to do the social media game, yes. start sharing your work on Pinterest where people are actually looking for it. I completely um, agree. That's a great Yeah. Point. Or some other way, Patreon or whatever. I don't know enough about Patreon to really talk about it. But yeah, it's really interesting when you see people looking to grow their social media following, but they don't have a way to convert it into anything other than like ego validation, which is going to fade pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, whether it's an email list or a merch shop or whatever it may be, growing just to feed the beast is really not going to be a long-term solution, which is woof. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that's true. Period. I think that, that's the thing I have to go back to over and over again is what is it about? I'll really speak for myself, like over and over again. I can get into this headspace of, I'll be as crass as I probably feel it sometimes. Viral short form videos. I've <laughs> got to figure this out, man. And I'm just being honest because I have a feeling that most creators feel that, whether they would mm -hmm. admit it or not. And mm -hmm. I think that the more I've really observed and analyzed where that feeling's coming from is I think that it's very much about that it was reverse engineered by the companies themselves. Like, right. There are reasons why almost every reason I can imagine why I would feel that pull has nothing to do with the kind of creative work that I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't have anything to do with how to sell the creative work I want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Viral videos it's... don't translate. No. So and anytime I think about doing short form video, and it actually feels worth my time is when it's literally, like you said, like you making the jingle, which is like, oh, this is a thing I want to do. I have right. a cool, I, like, I just have an idea right now to promote the latest episode in a short form video. And I just want to do it because I just mm -hmm. like the right. idea. Okay. So I just said short form or uh, viral content doesn't translate. I want to just clarify that really quick. A video that goes viral that isn't associated with your brand or like has a call to action or something like that. Like I have seen product shops post one video and they're sold out overnight. That's amazing. Sure. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. That's probably one in a million type of situation, but like just a regular video for virality, it's not a perfect formula. And I will say that I really have enjoyed experimenting on TikTok and just doing like talking head videos. And I've never once had a video go viral. I have just consistently shown up for like two years posting the same type of content of educational talking heads. And I see my numbers increase every day. I'm not trying to be an influencer. I'm not trying to make money off of it. I'm ultimately trying to point people back to our courses and our content and to come to the conference and things like that. But I don't need a video to go viral. And I also don't need 7,000 people or 40,000 people or whatever to come. I need like 300 people or something, <laughs> like, yeah. you know? And so it's not a one size fits all go viral and your business will blow up overnight. Of course, we've all seen that happen to people, but I think it often becomes temporary or is associated with a trend and it's just not sustainable. So I think if you're not having fun, if you're having fun making those TikToks and those reels, get it, you know? Yeah, man. Go yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think especially yeah. if, I think if short form video is, really obviously connected to the product that you have and the value that you want to build your business around. If it's very obviously connected to that, then it's a great place to, like if you're a comedian, TikTok could be a really good investment because comedy is, a lot of people open TikTok to laugh. So it mm -hmm. makes tons of sense or to learn. That can really, really work. But I think in terms of like viral videos, to me, more often than not, not the exception to the rule, but the rule is that they're not even the lottery, but they're Chuck E. Cheese or they're a <laughs> casino. So the lottery, at least it's like, oh yeah, very few people win, 
but the people that win get millions of dollars. Like that's crazy. Mm. But at a casino or at Chuck E. Cheese, <laughs> Chuck like e. Cheese. <laughs> you don't get money. You get tickets. And the that like you're like, I got millions of tickets, man. That's what millions of followers are, millions of views <laughs> on your video. You go to exchange that and you're like, oh God, this I just made eight hundred dollars. You're like, no. There's like the follower <laughs> count and the views. There's like an exchange rate thing where your brain can't comprehend that. Yeah, you got this millions of views favorite on TikTok, analogy. But did it actually, the prizes <laughs> that you got in exchange for those, you could have literally just go bought, you know, bought, you, you spent $300 at Chuck E. Cheese for a stuffed animal that cost $10. Wait, you know now they're going to make me, now they're going to make me sit down and watch these animatronics dance inappropriately. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I get. That would be a good TikTok, but yeah. We, we have the really humongous teddy bear like that you would win at a, fair or something except it's from costco i have to say costco like that and it is the bane of my existence and i hid it the other day in our attic just to like mm -hmm. test the waters and immediately even my husband was like where's the teddy bear and i was like it's in the garbage <laughs> in the garbage and they that's were like, what happens from your tickets people that's what those <laughs> tickets are worth yeah. Exactly. Oh, that bear. It's so humongous. Also, it was like $20 at Costco, whereas a whole day playing at Chuck E. Cheese, searching for pea covered balls or whatever yeah. those things are. <laughs> oh, that yeah. thing is well, scary. on that note, <laughs> we have to, we have to wrap <laughs> yeah. up. We're so over time. Oh my God. I love Sorry. this conversation. I love every conversation with you. It's, it's really yeah. fun to chat with Same. you and yeah. hear inside the inner workings of your brain. It's, very, very <laughs> it's a beautiful fun. place. In case anyone else, you know, it's like Andy J. Preacher, who is this? Will you do a quick shout out of where people can like, comment, subscribe? Yeah. And we'll drop it in the show notes. <laughs> Go check out my short form videos at Instagram at <laughs> Andy J. Pizza. And then you can also find my podcast at creativepeptalk.com or wherever podcasts are, it happens to be. It's one wherever. of the few podcasts that are everywhere podcasts are. <laughs> I love that. All right. Yeah. This was great. <laughs> Anywhere. Yeah. Thank you Thanks so much. <laughs> this was a great Thank conversation you. and we'll talk to you later. Thanks. All good things.